How we live in YouTube, what's cracking? Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We're switching things up a little bit today. We are not doing my weekly Thursday video and I apologize for that if you guys were looking forward to it or counting on it. As always, you can ask me questions in the comment section below or on Twitter, go follow me there. You can even DM me on Instagram. I have plenty of people to do that. So go follow me on Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. And I thought it would be a little OD if I went with a video Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because not everyone has time to consume that much content. I understand, I'm empathetic towards that. What we're doing, since I mentioned it in a couple of videos ago, I wanted to redo a first round fantasy football draft 2017 based on the eight weeks since we're midway through the season. And speaking on that, Guys, we're midway through the season, fantasy football, meaning you still have five, six weeks left in your regular season. As bad as you were in the in the first half, if you're two and five, if you're three and five or two and six, whatever your record is, remember, you could flip that around in the second half, right? You could easily go five and one over the second half of the year. All it takes is an ACL tear or demotion, something like that, for you to go from 100 points a game to 125 points a week, something like that. So keep your head straight, keep digging, Keep clawing, it's a full season, people. Don't give up on your team yet. But we wanna do this mock draft, right? And there was this was this was a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be, right? There's a lot of dudes that I really, really like, and I would be happy with a first round pick as of right now, based on the analysis that I've done. So I was gonna keep it smaller, but since there's so many guys I like, this is gonna be a 14 team mock draft. Because I felt bad leaving some guys out. You know, I don't wanna be a bully to none of these guys. I know they're gonna get mad at me because I know some of them, some of the NFL players watch these, you know, Shady McCoy once texted me and was like, bruh, how I'm not in the must starts on a weekly basis? How are you gonna sit me, dog? I'm like, I'm sorry, baby, I didn't mean that. I was just scared. I was just scared of being a nobody. Name that movie. So, uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's mock it up, boy. Also, the way I'm doing this, right? This draft, this mock draft is based solely on the insights analysis we have from the eight weeks leading up to this. No one is injured in this mock draft, meaning I'm gladly drafting David Johnson again. Zeke's suspension is not being held because it's no fun if you can't get those guys in the first round right now. So we're gonna pretend it's a new fresh slate, right? And none of these guys are injured, no one is suspended. So they're all in play. What we're basing this off on is you know going into the season there was a lot of QB battles there was a lot of position battles that we weren't quite sure what was going to happen but now we know who's won the jobs who has benefited from other people winning the jobs and things like that so that's where we're going to go off of and uh and and we'll start with number one and I think this is a very easy clear pick Le'Veon Bell he was the number one guy for me going into the season I had him I had him ranked ahead of David Johnson going into the season and he would be my number one pick had I done a mock draft or had I done a real draft starting tomorrow. You know, after a slow start, he got he got off um, to a bad start because of probably the holdout, right? And he might not have been in game shape. But since then he has been uh he's RB4 on the year overall. If you take out week one of play against the Browns where he had like 10 carries, didn't do much. He's RB1. So take out week one. I'm sorry, let me move my laptop over here so I can see my notes a little better. If you take out week one, he's RB1 in fantasy on the year. Ahead of Kareem Hunt, Fournette, all of these guys. Gurley, doesn't matter. He's RB1 if you take out week one. Also, if you take out week one, this is what his, his pace is for the season based on his stats from week two up until week eight. He's on pace for 2,130 total yards, 11 and a half touchdowns, 73 receptions on an absurd 494 touches. 494 touches. God damn. So there's no reason to demote him, right? Their their offensive line is still ranked within the top 10 in terms of uh, football outsiders, run blocking. Yeah, I'm drinking my coffee with a straw. It's good for your teeth. Some of y'all, I've seen your teeth in your profile pics. Some shits are yellow. Make sure you drink your coffee with a straw. Nothing much to say here. So Le'Veon Bell, number one. Le'Veon, so nothing much to say here. Le'Veon Bell, number one. Numero dos, David Johnson, just as I had it in the preseason. Like I said, he's healthy. We're going to pretend he's healthy for argument's sake. Uh, Palmer will be healthy as well, so he's back under center. Johnson's the easy number two here. I'm sure a lot of people, if they were drafting tomorrow, would be okay taking David Johnson number one as well, like they were in the preseason. Uh, you know, he's a triple threat, and he'll see 25 touches a game as long as he's playing. In the first week of the season where he got hurt and broke that wrist, he had 17 touches already, and it was only the third quarter, including six catches, 
Um, so you were just seeing the amount of usage that he was going to get that they talked about all preseason. Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson, number three, Antonio Brown. Still exactly the same order I had in the preseason. Wide receiver, Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, it's just uh, just another year in the booming business for the Brown office, man. He's just doing his thing once again. He's sitting as wide receiver number one right now in PPR leagues. If he finishes the season as number one wide receiver in PPR leagues this year, this would be his fourth straight season doing so. That is crazy. That's insanity, right? Even though his he only has three touchdowns right through half the season, so his sixth touchdown pace would be the lowest since 2012 when he had five touchdowns. So this low pace of touchdowns, and he's still going to finish as wide receiver one in PPR if he if he continues this way. I, I don't think there's anything more that needs to be said, right? He's already had three games with 155 receiving yards. He leads the NFL in targets, receptions, and receiving yards. He's on pace for 114 catches, 1,670 yards, and six touchdowns. I will take that all day, every day. Even if someone finishes above him as wide receiver one, his floor is no worse than wide receiver three or four probably in fantasy. So, A. Brown all day. And number four, Zeke. We're going to Ezekiel Elliott again, man. So, up to this point, Bell, David Johnson, Antonio Brown, Ezekiel Elliott. It's exactly how I had my preseason rankings prior to the season. For me, nothing has changed. Also, if you're enjoying this video so far, give it that thumbs up button, boy. Scroll down a little bit, hit that button right, right there. Chuh, chuh, chuh. Anyway, Zeke, um, yeah, so number five after this pick is where things start to get interesting. He's tied for RB2 right now in standard with Todd Gurley in PPR leagues. He's tied with RB4, Melvin Gordon. Now, he had that he had that Denver Broncos game, right, where he ran like eight times for nine yards, and that was the low point um, of the season for him. Obviously, we know now that the Denver Broncos are the top rush defense in the NFL. Fantasy running backs just don't produce, unless your name is Orleans Darkwa, because everyone saw that shit coming. Uh, but since then, he has just dominated, right? Zeke has had 25 touches in every game besides that one. He's also had a touchdown and or 100 scrimmage, yard, scrimmage yards in every game besides that game. So that was the one outlier game. Besides that, Zeke is a high-end elite RB1 in fantasy still. The O-line coming into the season, people had question marks, right? That was kind of, not exactly a red flag, but it was a variable, right? They lose two of their linemen. Does that mess up the continuity? Does that mess up the chemistry? And we saw in the beginning of the season, it was a little bit slow for Zeke, right? We didn't know how, how well this line was going to mesh, and they've been doing so as of late, and it looks like they are completely back to form. It's four straight games with 130 total yards and seven touchdowns in that four-game span. So Zeke is on fire right now. It's too bad he has a suspension, but we're pretending he doesn't have the suspension for this mock draft's sake. What's bigger is his role in the passing game, though. Thou. Where art thou in the passing game, Zeke? Right now, he's on pace for 43 and a half receptions, 480 yards, and I didn't put in how many receiving touchdowns he is on pace for. Let me figure that out right quick. Uh, so he has two receiving touchdowns on the year through seven games. That would probably put him around maybe four and a half to... So four and a half, five touchdowns he's on pace for through the air. Now, when you look back at last year, he only caught 32 passes. So he's on pace to catch 12 more passes than last year. And he's on pace to catch a hell of a lot more passes of yardage. As dude, it's good vocabulary by me there. Anyways, you get the goddamn point. I'm sweating like a mother in here. I gotta get my goddamn water. What? What? We got notifications and all that stuff. Wait, let me check this out right quick. I said, Zam! I hate getting texts in the middle of my videos, but I feel like you guys always see my reactions and they're always ridiculous. Last year, Zeke only had five targets in two games. The entire season, five targets in two games. This year, he already has three games with five or more targets. And then he's only seven games into the season. So clearly, all that hype about him being used more in the past game under Scott Linehan is coming to fruition. And if, you know, if you're starting the season tomorrow, a fresh slate, he's obviously going to be continued as a pass catching back there. They really don't have much else in terms of that um, that role. So nothing has changed the top four picks. We have Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson, Brown, Zeke. Number five, this is where things get awesome. And I'm going with Leonard Fournette, the running back out of Jacksonville. The Jaguars. He's been a complete animal. He's taken this team and this running game to another level that I could have never seen coming. I wasn't 
high on him coming into the season. A lot of people were higher than I was. I don't think anyone could have possibly seen him being this dominant, right? You look at the line, you look at the quarterback play, you just, no one imagined that their defense would be this, this dominant. So everything is kind of lining up to fit perfectly for Fournette. And next year, that defense is going to be incredible another year together. Maybe they'll get a quarterback. Maybe they'll get Kirk Cousins. Imagine that in the offseason. That'd be weird, but it'd be kind of cool at the same time. So he's had at least one touchdown in every game that he's played in. And he's had 120 plus total yards in four out of the six games. He's only played in six because he missed last week's game um, before the bye. But one touchdown at least in every single game he's played in. He had two in one of the games. What puts him in the top five for me, right, what, what separates him from the other running backs is that breakaway ability and the breakaway speed. He already has two big play touchdowns of like 70, 75 plus yards. That's really, really hard to do in the NFL, right? A lot of guys have that 4-4 speed, 4-5 speed, uh, can get to the second level, but it's very hard to actually break away and capitalize all the way down the field, and he's proven that he can do that. So when you add that factor in, he can basically win you a fantasy game with one run, right? And I don't see that happening with, you know, a lot like Shady McCoy. You saw it with Kareem Hunt a little bit in the beginning of the year, but he wasn't breaking away 70, 80-yard touchdown runs. They were like 40, 50, things like that. Um, but but what's more surprising to me, even more so than, than the breakaway is his involvement in the passing game, even though Chris Ivory's been like crazily involved in his passing game too. Fournette's catching a lot more balls than I thought he would. Um, he has 20 targets and 15 catches through six games, which would put him on pace for 40 receptions, uh, which is really good for a guy that I didn't expect to play much on third downs, given that they had Yeldon, who was like a top five or eight receiving back last year um, and given that Fournette's week one of his weaknesses was pass blocking on third down I didn't think he would see a lot of play time on third down so catching 40 balls while it's not like an elite running back um, receiving number it's very very usable in PPR leagues so he's not like someone that you only want in standard leagues he's someone that you could you know you could play in PPR leagues without a without hesitation and again Fournette's been good on his own right it's not just breakaway it's not just catching the ball only Kareem Hunt, Le'Veon Bell, and LeGarrette Blunt have eluded more tackles than him total on the year. That's per PFF, and all three of those guys have played in two full more games than Fournette. I don't know if I said that right. Fournette's played in six. Hunt, Bell, and Blunt have all played in eight. So he's right behind them in tackles eluded, and he's played a lot less. So he is very good. He has his home run hitting speed. He can catch the ball. His 16-game pace through the six games that he has right now 1,952 total yards, 19 touchdowns, and 40 catches. That would have made him running back number two last year in PPR leagues, right behind David Johnson only. You know, so looking forward next year, he's a high-end elite uh, running back. And like I said before, one of the question marks coming into the year was that line, right? Were they going to be able to run block for him? Will they, will they open up holes for him? The Jets are ranked 11th in run blocking per Football Outsiders. And um, if they can continue that, and if they're actually going to improve year over year in that spot, Fournette is going to be an animal over the next five years. So he's my number five pick. Number six is my boy Kareem Hunt. Again, this was really tough to choose between Leonard Fournette and Kareem Hunt. Um, I would be ecstatic with either of them. Hunt has ex excelled for a lot of the reasons that people doubted him, right? His vision, his, his one-cut ability, his... Ability to finish runs, right? Get those extra two, three yards after a tackle hits him, right? Instead of four-yard gains, he's getting seven, eight, nine-yard gains out of it. And that adds up over time in fantasy. Um, and he had a few of those breakaway plays in the beginning of the year, right? Where he was, every game it seemed like he was going for a 40 or 50-yard touchdown. Had to wait till the last quarter, you know, just to give people a quick heart attack. But he's come through. Um, but I will say, though, he hasn't looked as good as he did in the beginning of the year, which is why I'm a little more down on him than Fournette. Because Kareem Hunt, you know, being a rookie, it's hard to it's hard to stay up at that level of uh, a production and ability for an entire year. And I mean, it goes with Fournette too, right? He he dealt with with lower body injuries at LSU. And he's, he's dealing with him now, although he's going to be healthy for this week. I'm more nervous about Kareem Hunt staying, you know, at, at his ability, not so much injury for the rest of the year. And that, that remember like Spencer Ware last year, starting running back for Kansas City, really, really good over the first half of the year. 
not very good over the second half of the year. He wore down, and I'm wondering if the same thing is going to be happening to Hunt. He's still getting the workload, but his numbers have dipped, right? So he hasn't found the end zone in five straight games now. After scoring six times in the first three games, he averaged a ridiculous 8.5 yards per carry in those first uh, first three games, but in the last five games, only 3.6 yards per carry. He hasn't found those breakaway runs that he that he did in the beginning, and those aren't you know those are obviously fluky, um, and and you're not going to depend on those in order to save your fantasy day. My, my other concern is kind of down by the goal line, right? He only has three carries inside the five-yard line, which is tied for 21st among running backs in the league. You know, you can't, like I said, you can't rely on, on those long touchdown runs all the time unless, you know, unless you're like an AP in his prime or Chris Johnson or a Leonard Fournette. So if he's not getting a, enough goal line carries, it's going to be hard to rely on him as a, um, as a touchdown scorer on a week-to-week basis. You know, Alex Smith really coming into his zone. He's scoring touchdowns from far out, from deep. They're letting him throw more in the red zone. So it, it is a slight concern from Kareem Hunt. I'm not worried about him actually getting the work when they're down there because it's not like, you know, he has three carries inside the five, but it's not like Charkandrick West has like seven. I think he has like one, and, and I don't even think he has one, honestly. I think Alex Smith has one, but Hunt's getting the work there, but they're just not, they're not having enough volume down there to give him the work. Um, but what you have to love about him is obviously uh, the three down skill set, right? He's on pace for 56 catches and 614 receiving yards, which is fifth in the NFL right now among running backs for receiving yards. So he's a three down back, and that's what you look for in a first round pick as a running back. So that is number six. We have so far Le'Veon, DJ, Brown, Zeke, Fournette, Kareem Hunt. Number seven, DeAndre Hopkins of the Houston Texans. Another guy I was a little bit low on because, um, you know, the question was never his talent. You, you, I would never question his ability and his his ability to be an elite receiver when the ball's thrown to him accurately. The question was the quarterback play. And uh, it's safe to say that's no longer a, uh, a question there with the Texans because Deshaun Watson, the rookie out of Clemson, has taken the league by absolute storm. He might end up in, in my first round. He might he might knock off that number 14 spot. I'm just kidding. You know I'm all about the late round quarterbacks. Um, anyways, right? Uh, oh yeah, and well, I mean, after the game, after the last game, <coughs> the Texans for Seahawks game, which is a great game, Richard Sherman said he came to the camera and he said Watson will be a top five quarterback in the league by next year. That includes Aaron Rodgers, that includes Tom Brady. Richard Sherman is not one to mince words, right? If he doesn't like somebody, he doesn't think they're good. He's going to let you know about it. And that's pretty high praise, right? you got to respect Sherman's word for it. He's a smart dude. He's intelligent. He's played against a lot of good quarterbacks, and he's on a very good defense. So for him to say that about Watson, this is this is something that stood out to me, and this is something that speaks volumes of the potential of DeAndre Hopkins in this um, in this offense. And, you know, with uh, with, with Hopkins and and Deshaun Watson just, just meshing like, like sex and cigarettes out here, they're going to be doing this for, for years to come. He's a no-brainer elite wide receiver one, as you can see. He's my second wide receiver off the board. He's leading the NFL with a 35.3 target market share on his team. That's ridiculous. He's seventh in the NFL with a 32% red zone target share right now, and he's fourth <coughs> in the NFL with 44% of the end zone targets in Houston. You can see how often they use him down there, which is surprising because he actually wasn't utilized that much over the last few years in the end zone and inside the 10-yard line. So this is great news for him. Uh, he has a league leading seven receiving touchdowns. He's on pace for 103 catches, almost 1,400 yards, and 16 touchdowns. If you were, for some reason, worried about Will Fuller eating into his workload, uh, you just like don't be because since he returned, since Fuller's returned in week four, Hopkins has scored in every game that Fuller's been back in in those four games, and he's actually scored six times in those four games, averaging over 100 receiving yards per game, including that blow up game of like 220 plus yards so fuller gives fuller gives hopkins a much needed like distraction um for the opposing defenses right in the beginning of the year without fuller it was hopkins getting like 15 12 13 18 targets a game but the defense only had to target in on hopkins it was you know it was impossible for him to get separation with six guys on him now with fuller spreading the field and just being an absolute dominant deep threat and scoring all these touchdowns defenses can't just stick to hopkins so in my opinion this is a great thing for him and uh i would be happy with him as my wide receiver one number eight after hopkins another wide receiver odell beckham jr again he's healthy 
because we're playing mat. We're we're doing witchcraft over here, right? Nobody hurt. Ain't nobody. Everybody eating. We all eating out here. And uh, you know, prior to Odell Beckham's gruesome ankle injury, he was back to his top form, right? The focal piece of this New York Giants offense. Um, if you, you know, you got to take out that Week Two game against Detroit because he he didn't play a full slate of his snaps, right? He only played like sixty percent of the snaps when he's usually an eighty-five to ninety-five percent player. So I'm not, you know, I'm counting those stats into his his normal workload and and what we would expect from him. Um, in the three weeks following Week Two, his initial return, he caught twenty-one balls on a ridiculous thirty-six targets, and he scored three times in those three weeks. You know, that game-breaking, playmaking ability that he brings to the game in, in in and out of every single week, bringing touchdowns over the middle, scoring them deep, you know, just getting all those targets is something that is amazing. Like, I, I had hope in my E-Town Get Down League when I had Odell Beckham there. With like a blink of an eye, right, he scores you 14 or 15 fantasy points with one single catch. So um, as long as he's healthy, that is always going to be prevalent in his game. He's Probably the single greatest raw talent at receiver that we've ever seen in terms of athletic ability. Don't at me. So he is my number eight pick in my wide receiver three off the board. Now, my running back, is that five? Maybe six? I don't know. Pick number nine. This one hurts me a little bit to say. It's going to be Todd Gurley. And I'll tell you what. I am not admitting defeat on Todd Gurley. I still don't think he's a great running back. But... There's no point of arguing against this situation. I'm not going to take the high. I'm not going to argue against Todd Gurley just for the sake of doing it because I, I was all you know I was I was so against him early in the season, coming into the season. But what I don't think what Sean McVay has done with this Rams offense and the what the front office has done with this offense can be talked about enough. This might be like the single greatest turnaround of a franchise in history. You guys understand how bad they were last year. Right, and they go out get Robert Woods, Sammy Watkins, draft uh, Cooper Cup in one swing of a bat. They just had three good outside weapons or three good receiving weapons. Now they bring in uh, Andrew Whitworth. Uh, Jared Goff has developed. This defense is—I mean, the defense has been what it is. But it's just they—they they went from like the one of the worst teams in the league to a legit playoff contender, and they're sitting at five and two, tied with the Seahawks at the top of the division. So. Um, everything on this team is just taking a complete 180. There are a few major factors that have contributed to Gurley's turnaround season, which will be prevalent for the next year, two years, or whatever in fantasy. The first one is the offensive line. Listen to these stats. Last year, according to Football Outsiders, the Rams graded out in the bottom five in the NFL in both run blocking and both pass blocking, per Football Outsiders. In 2017, with the addition of McVay, with the addition of Whitworth at left tackle, this Rams offensive line ranks in the top three for both run blocking and pass blocking. So in one offseason, they go from bottom five in both to top three, which is crazy. No one could have seen that coming. I get that Whitworth is a lockdown, Pro Bowl type of, of tackle, but for the entire line to swing things around is just very it's mind-blowing. Um, the next factor was just this offense overall and the scoring opportunity, opportunities that have opened up for Gurley, right? They averaged 14 points a game last year, which was dead last in the NFL. They're scoring over 30 points a game this year. Uh, over a two, over 16 point difference in points per game this year, which is second in the NFL. Gurley is second in the NFL with eight carries inside the five yard line this year. He had 10 all of last year. So they're only halfway through the season. He has two less carries inside the five than he had all of last year. This team is scoring way more. He's getting way more goal line and red zone looks, which obviously just will eventually contribute into fantasy points, especially with the volume that he's getting. So him, you know, he had five touchdowns all of last year. He already has eight. It's just ridiculous. The turnaround here is just absurd. And I, like, if you're a Rams fan, I feel so bad for the Chargers because right, they're both moving. It, it's like being first to market, right? They're both moving, but the Rams are, you know, everyone, it, it's a feel-good story. They were so bad, now they're on the upswing, and, like, they'll have the next five to eight years of being very, 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 very good. And you get you get to say as a Rams fan, like, oh, we get to pick out of our two L.A. teams. We came in from the bottom. So that's pretty swaggy. I'd be pumped up if I was a Rams fan. Uh, the last thing that really, really, really stood, stood out and standing out to me is his involvement in the receiving game, right? It's been ridiculous. Not that he wasn't involved last year. Because he caught 43 passes, which is, again, a good number for a running back. 
but I figured with the additions of Dunbar and, and uh, some other pass catching backs that they would have more of an effect on his workload. Hasn't been the case. Already, he's only 34 receiving yards behind his entire total of last year. Um, his yards per reception number is up from 7.6 to 10.9 this season. And he's already caught three touchdown passes through the air. He had zero all of last year. He's on pace for 62 catches this year, which would have been third overall last year behind only Le'Veon Bell and David Johnson. That is so ridiculous to me how, you know, all three of those things just lined up perfectly for Gurley. So he's absolutely dominating all the work in this backfield in a much, much, much improved offense behind a much improved offensive line. There's nothing not to like about him. The only reason, uh, the reason I had the other backs, the other running backs, the Kareem Hunts, Fournettes, you know, all those guys ahead of Todd Gurley is simply because Gurley is not as good. I, how do I put this? Gurley is the most replaceable guy out of those three. Fournette is the least replaceable guy out of those three easily. Yeah, I, I, I got some stats on Gurley, right? Out of 38 running backs that have at least 50 carries this year, so there's 38 qualified running backs, Gurley is 28th in yards after contact. He's 29th in tackles avoided per attempt. Um, so it's like he's not really like doing that much as a running back as much as the system is doing for him. Ask not what you could do for your team, but what your team could do for you. That's basically what it is. Gurley kind of flipped, flipped the switch on, on the old saying, and the Rams are eating, thus he is eating. So I actually think Gurley is the least effective back out of all the backs that have been named so far. He's just probably in one of the most ideal systems. So I would gladly have him as my RB1 because he's going to keep eating. I would just say I still don't think he's good. So that's number nine. Rounding out the top ten, we got LaShawn McCoy in Buffalo. The workload is, is nothing you're ever going to have to worry about here with Shady. He has 18 or more touches in every single game this year, and he has 25 or more touches in four out of the seven games they've played. Um, he was having trouble finding pay dirt, but that was just a matter of time given the, like, the volume and the amount of opportunity he has, and he now has three rushing touchdowns in the last two Buffalo games as this team is really coming into their own. They're switching things up on offense, right? They got Calvin Benjamin now, Tyrod Taylor, as always, is turning heads for people that doubted him. Um, so, Coy's doing his usual, right? He's third among running backs and receptions, and the team is, again, second in the NFL in rushing attempts per game. 32.6. They're trailing only the Jaguars. And surprisingly, they were second in the NFL last year behind only Dallas. They're actually up two more rushing attempts per game this year than they were last year. And that was a lot of, uh, that was a, lot of a question mark for people that were, you know, evaluating uh, Shady as the new scheme, the new the new coaches and things like that, the new offensive uh, kind of plays that they were going to run. People thought that it wouldn't be so run heavy. But in fact, it's even more run heavy than it was in the previous year. And that might have been because they've lost a lot of personnel, a lot of uh, passing game personnel. But either way, they're running the ball a ton. I don't think that's changing. Um, if you were okay with him as a top 10 pick, which basically 99% of the fantasy community was in the summer, then you should be fine with him now as a top 10 pick. And you could easily argue McCoy over Gurley if you wanted to here. So that's the top 10. As you said, I as I said before, there's still a ton of guys that I just really like here that I still want to um, fit in here because I think they're worth talking about. Number 11 would be Jordy Nelson, man. Just because he's not flashy doesn't mean it's not a good pick. Through the first five weeks of the season, a.k.a. with Aaron Rodgers, before he got hurt that week and then missed the next, you know, whatever, he's out. Jordy was the wide receiver one on a points per game basis in standard scoring. Wide receiver four in PPR league. So he's still a top tier wide receiver as long as Aaron Rodgers is healthy, which he is for the sake. And, you know, that's what you're going to get when them two are on the field together. They have a chemistry unlike almost any receiver quarterback combo in the league. He's always going to be looking for Jordy down by the end zone. Um, you're not you're not worrying about his ceiling, right? You're not worrying about his floor, there will be guys who outscore him. There will be guys who probably finish ahead of him in fantasy, but you could almost guarantee him being in the top five, top six as a fantasy wideout. He's not going to lose you your league, I'll tell you that, if you take him with your first round pick. So we'll just move along with Jordy Nelson here, as safe as they can be. Numero 12, Mike Evans. Sitting at wide receiver five right now, Evans is yet to have uh, a poster mark breakout game this year. He hasn't gone over 100 receiving yards yet in any of the seven games they've played, mostly because Jameis Winston hasn't been very good. 
but he has not seen less than eight targets in a single game. So he's still getting a ton of targets. He's still easily, the, obviously, the top wide out there, the top option in the passing game here. And he's been between 50 and 100 receiving yards in every game. So it's not like he has any, like, 35-yard receiving games. He had, I know, he had 49 yards in one game. Like, I don't, don't, please don't go comment that. Don't waste your time. Um, and he's, and he scored in more games than he hasn't this year. So he scored in four of the seven games he's played in. He's on pace for 155 targets this year, uh, which is less than the 170 he had last year, which led the NFL. But, you know, you had to see that coming when you, when you add in Deshaun Jackson, when you draft OJ Howard and things like that. His size and athleticism alone keep him, you know, they keep him in a place where he's still an elite NFL red zone, end zone target, right? Um, and he's a he's a threat to go for double digit touchdowns in the next five years, and he probably will hit that number again this year. It, you know, it's good to see, even though the the dip in targets overall uh, is happening, there he's getting the targets in the right places. So last year I went back and looked. He he saw only seven targets inside the ten yard line last year. He already has five this year. So he's two behind where he was last year, and they still have nine games left on the season. He has a 38 and a half end zone target share and a 29% red zone target share. So when they get down there, Winston's first look is at Evans. He just hasn't been down there that often. So once this offense kind of turns around, which I I don't know if I actually expect them to turn around, but I expect Winston to get a little better as the year goes on. They'll have more opportunities down there. And I definitely think Mike Evans will hit that double digit touchdown range. According to playerprofiler.com, Evan ranks fifth in the NFL in target distance. Distance traveled by all intended targets. That was a tough one to figure out. Meaning, they're still throwing to him deep. They're still looking downfield, which is good considering they added Deshaun Jackson. Probably, maybe one of the best deep threats in the NFL still, even at his elderly grandpa age. So, Mike Evans still the leader in this uh, in this ball team. Still the, the main target for Mike Evans. Still a huge touchdown threat. I'll take him at number 12. 13, A.J. Green. I know a lot of you guys. He was actually like my number 5 or 6 player on the board this offseason. I actually, you know what? I think I had AJ Green ranked above Mike Evans when I wrote this blog post and I didn't save it. So I would take AJ Green 12, Mike Evans 13. So flop those two. And I really want to take Green. You know, I would love to put him as like a top six or eight pick, but I feel like the consistency, it just isn't there. And I, and that's definitely not him. That's, that's a product of his offense. It's a product of Andy Dalton. It's a product of them being Super safe. They just they don't utilize him. They don't game plan towards AJ Green as much as they should if they want to win more games. He's gone over 75 receiving yards in just two of their seven games this year. And he's caught five passes in just two of those games as well. So, you know, he has his big games. Obviously, he's capable of those big breakout plays and having the big games, but they're they don't come often. So they don't give him enough looks. He's a guy like if you get like Julio, if you give him enough goddamn looks, he's gonna make plays happen. But they just haven't done that. He only has three targets inside the 10-yard line this year, which puts him outside of the top 30 at wide receiver, which is absurd for, for a guy like A.J. Green. Um, so, realistically, it's kind of the same story as Julio Jones. You know, he's a guy with super immense, ridiculous elite talent. They just don't feed him enough, and they don't play to his strengths. They don't play their offensive strengths, which could be a, a sign of their offensive line, right? Andy Dalton not getting enough time back there, but that's going to be a problem for the future. So that's why I would have him as pick number 13. Pick number 14. This one was so damn hard. This one was between... I also have some honorable mentions at the end. This one was between Melvin Gordon, Julio Jones, and Mark Ingram. I wanted to put Mark Ingram in here so bad, and I really think I might take him at 14 if I had this pick today, but I put Melvin Gordon as 14. You know, it's clear that the Chargers have no plan on on stopping feeding Melvin Gordon. I don't know if that came out right, but they're, they're going to keep feeding him. That's he going to keep eating. That's basically what I'm getting at here, right? His efficiency numbers don't have to be good as long as the volume and the touchdowns are there, and they definitely are. He's on pace for his first 300-touch campaign. He's on pace for 320, to be exact, and he already has eight touchdowns through eight games. So obviously, that's not going to keep going, but, you know, if he's going to keep putting up numbers, people are always saying touchdown regression. Sure, but he's probably a good bet to score double-digit touchdowns because he's so involved in both the rushing and receiving game in that part of the field because, you know, they don't have Danny Woodhead anymore. They don't have really any other options in the backfield. So Melvin Gordon's our go-to guy anywhere when it comes to pay dirt. Um, his production in the passing game has been super hit and miss. If you look at the stats overall, they're good, right? While last year he only had three games of five receptions or more, 
He's done that already in four games, right? In half of his games, he's had five or more receptions. So four of the eight games they've played this year, five or more receptions. However, in the other half of the games, he has one or less reception. So he has two games with one reception, two games with zero receptions, and then four games with five or more. So half the games he's been really good passing, half the games he's been really bad at, at catching. So that's an inconsistency there, but he's still getting the rushing volume. Um, they also have a bunch of injuries in, this, in the offseason leading up to their to their you know their season opener so their line is not at full strength which it will be last year it ha next year it will be much better than you know what they're ranking right now which is i think 27th yeah 27th in run blocking per football outsiders so uh, the chargers you know i mean it's just something that keeps happening to them the injuries and stuff they will improve eventually on that offensive line and gordon will keep seeing the works keep seeing them touchdowns so that wraps up the top 14. I'll go through it real quick again. We have Le'Veon Bell, 1, David Johnson, 2, Antonio Brown, 3, Zeke, 4, Leonard Fournette, 5, Kareem Hunt, 6, DeAndre Hopkins, 7, Odell, 8, Todd Gurley, 9, LaShawn McCoy, 10, Jordy Nelson, 11, AJ Green, 12, Mike Evans, 13, Melvin Gordon, 14. Honorable mentions, Julio Jones, Mark Ingram, Jordan Howard, Devonta Freeman, Des Bryant, Michael Thomas, Rob Gronkowski. I would say Julio and Mark Ingram, possibly Jordan Howard are the ones creeping up into, into the back end of that. And um, the Dez's, Michael Thomas's, Gronks are probably a little farther out, uh, but still second round picks for sure. Uh, let me know what you guys agree with or disagree with and who you would take over who in terms of, you know, some of the questionable ones I had. I got to tell you, man, if you try to sit down and like write out your top 14, it's really, really hard at this point in the season. Um, but that was the best I could do. If you enjoyed the video, please, as always, scroll down a little bit, give it that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. I hope y'all enjoyed. And uh, since I'm not putting out a weekly video on Thursday, of course, ask me questions on Twitter, Instagram, email, comment down below, whatever you got to do. And I'll see y'all on Sunday, as always, with the live stream. So make sure you have my notifications turned on or are following me on Twitter so you know when I go live. Let's get it.